Good morning and welcome. These are the readings and sermon for Sunday, January 31st. Let us begin. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you gather the whole universe into your radiant presence and continually reveal your Son as our Savior. Bring wholeness to all that is broken and speak truth to us in our confusion that all creation will see and know your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is a reading from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. A reading from Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Oreb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name, a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm is a reading of Psalm 111. Alleluia! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. Our second reading this morning is from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there are many so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think the food that they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take, but take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it's weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat, 
so that I may not cause one of them to fall. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now a reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When I think of teachers, I think of Mrs. Romer, my fourth grade teacher who helped me memorize the Gettysburg Address and then clapped for me when I successfully recited it in front of the class. I think of Mr. Tegas, one of only a few male teacher role models who made learning about psychology and sociology fascinating and challenging, also sparking my interest for greater study in those areas in college. I think of Mr. Kachapudi, my favorite history teacher, who helped us connect the dots between the past and the present. I think of teachers like these, and I'm amazed at the impact they've had on my life and the lives of so many other students. I'm amazed at the way good teachers continue to feed us long after we've left their presence. They spent long hours in school. They had to deal with some kids who didn't want to learn. They won't ever be famous, yet what power they've had. But I've also had some teachers and college professors who probably should have found another profession. The only thing I remember from their classes was counting down the days until it was over. Teachers have been entrusted with much power. They can change and impact lives. They have power upon young lives to wound or heal, to encourage or discourage, to inspire or, or cause to expire a student's hopes and dreams. It's into this world of powerful teachers that our gospel lesson calls us this morning. It's early in the ministry of Jesus in the gospel of Mark. Mark has no birth narrative, no childhood stories. Mark begins with John the Baptist preparing the way with his teaching and with the baptism of Jesus and then jumps immediately into Jesus calling the disciples and the beginning of his ministry. And that's where we are today, the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And how does it begin? With teaching. But not just any kind of teaching. It's teaching unlike that of the scribes. It is teaching with authority. What's interesting is that we don't hear the content of Jesus' teaching. It's almost as if Mark is saying the content is in the important part. In the Gospel of Mark, what makes Jesus' teaching authoritative is his person. His teaching is authoritative because of who he is, for he is the Holy One of God. It's kind of like those good teachers in our past. We may not remember the details of what they taught as much as we remember the power of their person. The people automatically contrast Jesus' teaching with what they know, with what they've experienced, with the teaching of the scribes. And unlike the scribes, the people perceive Jesus to teach with authority. In other words, Jesus brings something extra to the table. Jesus' person has something the scribes don't. What is that something extra? Well, look at what happens next. 
Jesus heals a man with an unclean spirit. In the Gospel of Mark, there's no difference between Jesus' teaching and his healing. It's all part of the same package. So when the people hear Jesus teach with authority and see Jesus heal with authority, they're astounded and amazed because this is something new. This is not at all like what they've experienced with the scribes. This teacher is different. Now in today's world, we often use the words power and authority interchangeably. But for our purposes, I want to make a distinction between the two. If we peer into the world in which Jesus lived, the scribes, along with the Pharisees and Sadducees, had the power. They were the interpreters of the law. They decided what and who was acceptable and what and who was not acceptable. Their power was simply a giving. However, they didn't necessarily have the support or confidence of the people, so they lacked authority. Dictators, for example, may be powerful because they have an army to support them and back them up, but they lack genuine authority in the hearts and minds of the people. It's a similar situation for the scribes. The scribes are often presented in the Gospels as oppressors of the people who lack a genuine understanding of the law and who possess no understanding of grace. In other words, they're lousy teachers, but they're still powerful because of their position and get to call the shots. I want to argue, on the other hand, that genuine authority comes not from one's position in the society, but from somewhere beyond oneself. Teachers, for example, have authority. Their teaching is authoritative because of their God-given gifts, because God has called them to be teachers. They are good teachers for the right reasons because it's who they are as compassionate, caring, and gracious people. And it's those God-given, God-blessed aspects of their person that gives their teaching authority. Keep in mind, the same can be said of any profession where there's power and authority over others. Doctors, lawyers, politicians, clergy, business people, police, etc. Well, Jesus had the authority, but in the end, it was the scribes and Pharisees that had the power to call for his crucifixion. Authority in the best sense of the word is persuasive. It doesn't need nor does it depend on threats of force. So Jesus is different from the scribes because Jesus is said to teach with authority. Jesus' authority comes from above, directly from God. He is rightly identified by the demon as the Holy One of God. And it's Jesus' divine authority that we see unfold throughout the Gospel of Mark. However, this divine authority is constantly being critiqued by those in power because they feel threatened and challenged by fear of losing their power. And they're right to feel threatened and afraid because it's Jesus' divine authority that ultimately triumphs all worldly powers. We're given a, we're given a clue about just how all-encompassing Jesus' divine authority is when he heals the demon-possessed man. Now, we could get all hung up on the question of how to understand demon possession in the Bible. I like to take the Bible's word at face value. But talk of spirits and demons seems primitive and makes many people uncomfortable today, which I find kind of amusing. When my family and I were living at the seminary in Gettysburg, there was no shortage of people every night walking through the campus on the Ghosts of Gettysburg tour. It's big business there. But anyway, demons and evil spirits are supposed to be the stuff of bad B-movies, right? However, I don't think there's any argument that evil is still a problem. As St. Paul says, our enemy the devil walks this earth like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And this exorcism is an example of Jesus having the power and authority to overcome and defeat evil in any form in our world. And this authority of Jesus is what astounds the people, which is still astounding today if you think about it. 
What other power or authority is there that can overcome evil, eradicate it, and make it go away? We put people in prison, but that doesn't make evil go away. Or more close to home, how many of us struggle with the presence of evil in our own lives? Do we have the power or authority on our own to just make evil go away? Isn't the Apostle Paul's self-reflective question our daily question? He says, I don't understand my actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. There's an old Native American story about a chief instructing some of his young braves about the struggle within. It's like two dogs fighting inside of us, the chief told them. There's one good dog who wants to do right, and the other dog wants to do wrong. Sometimes the good, the good dog seems stronger and is winning the fight, but sometimes the bad dog is stronger and wrong is winning the fight. Who's going to win in the end, a young brave asks. The one you feed, the chief answered. My friends, the only food available to feed the good dog within us comes from above. It's the food of hope and grace whose nutritional authority comes from God. We don't have the power to overcome evil on our own. In fact, if left to our own devices, we would choose evil more often than good. This is precisely why we begin our worship services with the order for confession. Far from being the self-righteous hypocrites the world paints Christians out to be, we know all too well our own capacity for evil and our own need for forgiveness. And that's why we gather together each week. For it's here that we are perpetually astounded by the food of hope and grace. It's here that we meet the Holy One of God who has the authority to call evil out of us, to forgive us and to transform us. It's here that we are fed and nourished by the scriptures and the sacraments that make us one and transform us at the same time. And it is as we leave this place and follow the light out into the world that we of all people are given the authority by our Lord to speak and live and teach and heal in ways that feed a hungry and hurting world. Now that is truly amazing. Amen. And may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you all now and forevermore. Amen.